allow me just to extend a warm welcome once again to each and every one. And we love you so deeply here. When you come to the house of God, you walk through those front doors, there's something that transpires mm -hmm. that's deeper than, than life. It's in the spirit realm. And we're so glad that you are here with us today for we want to welcome those of you who are joining us online this morning. What an honor to come into your home, come into your truck, wherever you are finding us today. And stay with us because there's a powerful word that's going to come uh, our way today. What an honor it is to stand side by side with this young man, hmm. Pastor Chris, Kristen. We have been doing life for uh, quite a few years now, and yes. I just need to tell you that I love you and I'm so proud of what the man of God that you're becoming. Pastor Christian was a young man uh, in our church back in Minot, North Dakota. Mm. And so I've had the privilege of watching Chris uh, grow a beard. And um, <laughs> <laughs> he's still waiting on me to grow mine. <laughs> uh, Christian, we love you so deeply. You have had people all your life who've believed in you and have been praying for you. Yes. I love you. I love your family. Mm. love your parents, your siblings. We have a part of Christian's uh, family here today. <laughs> we love you guys so deeply. Mm -hmm. We're not just friends. We're family. Amen. Uh, I always tease. I said we could call Pastor Christian an international speaker <laughs> because together we ministered <laughs> in Mexico several times. <laughs> and... Uh, and we just uh, had a, such an amazing time. With. Wow. The other day, we were working in the church, and Pastor Christian was helping me do some things. And I just felt impressed just to speak into his heart and his life. I said, Pastor Christian, you are an amazing pastor. Mm -hmm. And he was gracious and said, thank you. I said, I want to tell you why you're an amazing mm -hmm. pastor. Pastor Christian and his family are going to be moving uh, to Kenmere, North Dakota, a beautiful city up north, mm. beautiful city, beautiful community. And yes. uh, Kristen and his family are part of our church planning team mm. here in Watford mm. City. And we're, we've been praying, mm. and God has spoken to you, and you're here. But I share with Pastor, I said, you know, Pastor Kristen, you're an amazing pastor, and I want to tell you why. And I said, you're an amazing pastor, Kristen, because you love God with all your heart. Mm. And your love for God and your love for people is pure. Mm. Pure. You have a humble spirit. God mm. can embrace that. Thank you, Pastor. You have a servitude spirit. Mm. And even Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Mm. He has a love for God's people. Mm. He has a love for the lost. He has a love for the world. Mm. And that's why in my book, <laughs> you're an amazing pastor. Mm. Church, it's my privilege to introduce Pastor Christian to you. Christian is going to be bringing the word of God to us. Could mm. you all help me to express love to mm. this young pastor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I was worthy of receiving that kind of an intro. I definitely don't feel like I'm an international speaker. <laughs> I can tell you that. Um, uh, but, uh, no, God has been so, so faithful, and um, Pastor Brady and I and, and even some of my family here today have uh, been able to travel to Mexico a number of times, and um, it's just been wonderful, wonderful seasons of, of ministry, and uh, we've, we've gotten to stay together in a, in a room called the Bat Cave. Uh, thankfully, there was no bats, uh, but uh, we, had a, we have had some wonderful moments of uh, of ministry together and, and memories that we'll never, never forget. And so um, never thought that I'd one day be on the same uh, team as Pastor Brady uh, in, in pastoral team. And so I'm so excited for that. Uh, so excited to have the opportunity to be here with you guys. Um, my wife, Rochelle, and, and my, my daughter, Faith, um, I think there's a picture uh, if you'd want to put that up. But uh, we are very excited to be part of this church family. Uh, we, right away from the beginning, we felt like we were embraced uh, into the family and one of all of you. And so we're so thankful for you 
Uh, and so thankful that we have your support as we go up to Kenmare to plant WCAG Kenmare and uh, to know that you guys are here as our prayer support and, uh, and that you are for us and with us and all that. And uh, so thankful for Pastor Sheldon. I know he wanted to be here today, uh, but he was not able to because of uh, different things with flights. And uh, so, but so thankful that he would uh, trust us to come in and to be a campus pastor uh, to go to Kenmare. So um, I don't know if there's uh, a, maybe a, a picture of Rochelle and, and Faith and I. <laughs> this is my beautiful family, and they're sitting right up here too. Rochelle, would you wave? Maybe stand. This is my daughter, Faith. And, yeah. I'm a very, very blessed man. Uh, our daughter, Faith, is uh, two going on 16, and um, she, she, loves to, uh, she loves to tell us what she thinks, but uh, she's, doing, she's doing so good growing, and she loves her Bible story. She loves uh, her mom and her dad, her family. Um, and so she loves Jesus. We're so glad for that. All right, so this, this morning I get the privilege of bringing to you uh, a Palm Sunday word, a uh, word from the Lord. But uh, before we get into uh, today's message, I just want to recap where we've been, where we've been. Uh, Pastor Sheldon two weeks ago started a series that he entitled Unexpected Endings. Unexpected Endings. And uh, he started off the series by talking about the story of Abraham and of Sarah and how they had Isaac at the age of 100 for Abraham and 90 for Sarah. Is there anyone that wants to have kids at that age here? <laughs> well, maybe not right now, but for them, this was a fulfillment of the promise that God had given them many years before. It was a fulfillment of that promise. And that in itself was an unexpected ending, the fact that they would have Isaac. But we fast forward a number of years, and we see that the story didn't end there. You see, God asks Abraham to sacrifice Isaac as a test. It was a test to see if Abraham loved God more than he loved his son. Really, for us, it's, it's, an, it's asking us the question, do we love God? the one who can fulfill the dream more than the dream being fulfilled? Do we love the one who can fulfill the dream, God, more than the dream being fulfilled? Now Abraham, in obedience, he takes Isaac to the mountain to sacrifice him, and as Abraham's about to kill his son, God stops him, and this is what he says, Now I know you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And really, this was a foreshadowing of what was to come, something we're celebrating starting even now and coming next Sunday when Jesus went to the cross for us. You see, God did not spare his own son, Jesus Christ, but Jesus went to the cross for you and I in our place to show us his great love for us. And then last week, uh, Pastor Sheldon brought us the story of Naaman, Naaman from the Old Testament. Now, Naaman was a captain in the enemy's army. He wasn't an Israelite. He wasn't a child of God in that sense. And he had leprosy. And he was told that if he would go to the prophet Elisha, that the prophet Elisha could heal him. And in an unexpected ending, after, after Naaman dips into the Jordan River seven times, he comes out completely healed completely clean. This is one of Faith's favorite uh, stories right now uh, in the Old Testament. And so she likes to say that Jesus healed him of all his owies. He healed him of all his owies. So as unexpected as that was, what happens next is maybe even more shocking. See, Naaman tried to pay Elisha for God's healing, but Elijah refused any payment from, from Naaman. His servant Gehazi, however, Elisha's servant Gehazi, he felt like Naaman should have to pay for something. I mean, who was Naaman that he should be healed? He was no child of God. He was not an Israelite. Why should Naaman receive such an amazing miracle, blessing, and not have to pay for it? So Gehazi ends up following after Naaman after he left, and he lies to him and says, oh, you know what, Elijah, 
He's changed his mind. Elisha has changed his mind. He's decided he'll take some of that payment from you. Naaman was happy to give it. And when Gehazi returns, he hides what he, what he took from Naaman. And Elijah confronts him and says, where have you been? What do you mean? I've not been anywhere. And Elisha knew what he had done and confronts him and says, now since you have taken a payment, you've taken this from Naaman, now you shall go and have the same disease on you that Naaman was just cleansed of. He went away with leprosy. And not only for himself, but for his entire family line. What an unexpected ending. And Pastor Sheldon discussed with us how, in a similar fashion, when we think that somebody has to, in some way, clean up their act before they come to Jesus, that we have the heart of Gehazi. That if we think that, in some way, somebody should have to pay for what Jesus has done in their life, that we have the heart of Gehazi. And that's not where we want to be. And so he ended last week talking about the ten lepers that were healed by Jesus. There was a group of ten, all of them had leprosy, but out of all the ten that were healed, only one came back to express his appreciation to the Lord. And that one happened to be a Samaritan, by the way. Only one came back. And so Pastor Sheldon was reminding us that we should be the one to come back. Let us have the heart of the leper who comes back and says, thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. Let's not have the heart of Gehazi, but the heart of the leper who came back. Thank you, Jesus, because it's all level ground at the foot of the cross. No one of us, not, not even one of us has more, uh, has deserved or earned any right to be there any more than anyone else. In fact, we can't deserve it. We can't earn it. It's only by the grace of Jesus Christ that we can receive from him. Thank you, Jesus. So that was our last two weeks of unexpected endings. There's way more that can be unpacked in those sermons. So if you haven't uh, been with us, I encourage you to take the time to go online and to watch them. They're on YouTube. Uh, but today we're going to keep going with where our unexpected ending for today. We're going to be looking at uh, the story of Jesus' Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I mean, of course, it's Palm Sunday, right? Now, before we get to that, I just want to take a brief moment to kind of give a little bit of a backstory about what's going on uh, in that day. So the Jewish people were under the oppression of the Roman rule, of, of the Roman Empire. See, the Jewish people, they longed for a day that when God would raise up among them a leader who would come and bring salvation and freedom, as was foretold by the prophets of old. So for many, many years, they've been waiting, intensely waiting for this, this foretold Messiah, this Savior, to come and bring deliverance. When Jesus comes on the scene, he starts doing many signs and wonders. And he starts teaching about this kingdom, the kingdom of God. And people are listening. They're starting to wonder, could this be the one? Is this the Messiah? Is this the one that's going to be our conquering king? Is he the one who's going to overthrow the Roman rule and restore God's people to their former glory? Through his three years of ministry, Jesus amassed a very large group of followers but there were specifically 12 men who he had taken under his wing to disciple. One of which, maybe more, but for sure one of them was actually a zealot. And a zealot was uh, a, someone who was part of a political group that was trying to physically overthrow the Roman government. So keep all of this in mind as we jump back into our story. The, the disciples have been following Jesus now for about three years and we're jumping in just as they're about to enter into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So Matthew chapter 21 is where we're going to be at, starting in verse 1. If you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to that or your electronic device, or it'll also be on the screen. So Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 1. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, 
As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Now, anyone in that day that would have been familiar with uh, the Old Testament scripture, that would have been their scripture, which would have been most of the people that would have been going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, for all of those people who had read this prophecy, they would have wondered when they saw Jesus on a donkey's colt, again, is this the one? Is this the one who will restore us? Is this the one who's going to restore Israel? So Jesus riding on the donkey's colt was just another confirmation that Jesus was the one they were waiting for. Let's continue in verse 6. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Praise God in the highest heaven! The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Who is this? they said. The crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, maybe you've heard this story before, and when you've heard it, maybe you heard them that they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! See, that word Hosanna that they shouted, it means Lord save, save now. So really, they're shouting with this anticipation, Son of David, save us! Son of David, save us! Restore Israel! Can you imagine what must be going through the minds of the disciples? Man, they think Jesus is well on his way to taking his throne, to overthrowing their physical oppressors. Even the crowds are proclaiming, he's the one to restore Israel. In their minds, the story is just getting geared up for the best part. You see, they had no idea that just a few days later, things would take a drastic turn and their idea of who Jesus should be would come to a tragic, unexpected ending. So let's fast forward a few days. Jesus has shared his Passover meal with his disciples and then he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. While he's praying late into the night, a group of armed men come to arrest Jesus and take him before the Jewish religious leaders. The Bible records that at this point, the disciples all fled out of fear, and Jesus was left alone with his captors. Now talk about a change of events. Can you imagine the confusion going through the disciples' minds? Jesus was supposed to be the one to be raised to power. He was supposed to be the one to restore Israel. Just a few days before, he had been welcomed into Jerusalem as if he was royalty, and now he was being arrested and treated like a common criminal. You see, there's this massive shift in the narrative. It catches the disciples off guard so much because it, the events that unfolded didn't line up with their understanding of who Jesus was supposed to be. I'm going to say that again. It caught the disciples off guard because the events that unfolded didn't line up with their understanding of who Jesus was supposed to be. So Jesus ends up before the religious leaders, and they're trying to find reason to condemn him. And since Jesus is innocent of any wrongdoing, they incite others to bring up false accusations against, them, against him. Now, if they would have had the power to kill Jesus on their own authority, they would have done it then and there. But they didn't, because remember, they're under Roman rule. 
So they ended up taking Jesus before the Roman governor Pilate to try to convince him to have Jesus killed. Now, Pilate ends up questioning Jesus, and he realizes that Jesus is not guilty of any crime. And that's where we're going to jump back in, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 15. Now, it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message, leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, which of these two do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas! Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah. They shouted back, crucify him. Why? Pilate demanded. What crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that he wasn't getting anywhere and that the riot was developing, a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. The responsibility is yours. And listen to this. This is a terrible, terrible response. All the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death. We and our children. Tragic. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. An unexpected ending, especially for the disciples. See, Jesus was supposed to race to power, take over the Romans, restore Israel, and now he was condemned to death. And the Roman soldiers, who were very good at their job, by the way, they knew what they were doing. They did exactly what they were ordered, and Jesus was crucified. He experienced the most excruciating death one could ever die. That was not the ending the disciples were expecting. That was not the ending the disciples were expecting. It did not fit into their understanding of Jesus as their Messiah and Savior. Their idea of the Savior they wanted died on the cross. I'm going to say that again. Their idea of the Savior they wanted died on the cross. But what they didn't realize was that at at that time was that out of his death, Jesus would be resurrected back to life as the Savior they needed. The Jesus they wanted was not the Jesus they needed. The Jesus they wanted was not the Jesus they needed. The disciples had built up this idea of who they wanted Jesus to be, a political conquering hero to overthrow their Roman oppressors, to restore glory to their people and their nation. But Jesus came to meet a much more pressing need, to save them from their sin, from a life bound for destruction and ultimately ending in eternal separation from God. So out of this unexpected ending, God brought a new beginning. Out of this unexpected ending of Jesus dying on the cross, God brought a new beginning. See, the disciples' idea of who Jesus was supposed to be had to die. The disciples' idea of who Jesus was supposed to be had to die so that they could receive the truth of who he really was and still is. I just wonder if there's maybe someone here 
that needs their idea of who Jesus is to die so that they can receive the truth of who he really is. See, if you've never put your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and the reason is because your idea of who Jesus is does not line up with what the Bible says about him, then you need to let that idea die so you can receive the truth of who he really is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3, it says, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. We're jumping ahead to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. It says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Guys, the Bible has so much, so much more to unpack, to teach us about Jesus. And I encourage every single person to read it for themselves. But if your idea of Jesus doesn't line up, even with those two small snippets of Scripture, then let it die so that you can receive the truth of who he is. Now, if I'm being honest, if we're all being honest, sometimes even after we've put our faith in Jesus, we don't always, our understanding of Jesus doesn't always line up with the truth that's in the Bible. Even after we put our faith in Jesus, sometimes our understanding of who Jesus is isn't actually accurate because it's not lining up with the truth of God's word. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, Paul is writing to the believers in the church in Colossae. These are people who have already put their faith in Jesus. He says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will, overthrow, you will overflow with thankfulness. D now listen to this. Chap verse 8 is very important. Don't let, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Again, he's writing to believers, people who have put their faith in Jesus already. I'm going to read it again. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. In my own life, there have been multiple times where I have had to let my wrong idea of who Jesus is and was of his gospel, I've had to let that die so that I could receive a greater revelation of who he really is. You see, for years as a follower of Christ, doing all the right things on the outside, I was still under bondage to sin, an area of my life I just could not find victory in. I had done all the right things on the outside, and I had tried so hard, and I would pray and ask Jesus to take these things from me, but you see, I had created this idea in my mind that I had to do all these things in order to please God enough that he would in, then, in return, take away my struggle. I had set up this false idea of who Jesus really was. In my mind, and, and I, I, it caused me to stumble even more. One day I failed and failed miserably. And I started to question my walk with the Lord. Now, I had no doubt that Jesus was the only Son of God, that he was the only way to God the Father, that he was the only way to heaven. But what I couldn't understand, what I couldn't work out in my mind was why I couldn't walk in the victory that Scripture talked about. When I had tried my hardest in my own effort and failed. You see, I didn't understand God's grace, how he sees me, or who he made me to be. I bought into a lie that Jesus had forgiven the sins of my past after coming to him, and that now it was up to me to stay saved. Guys, that's rubbish. 
That's rubbish. Remember what Colossians 2, 6 says. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Guys, how do any of us accept Christ? Is it through any works of our own? No. Is it through anything we've done? No. Can we earn it? No. Do we deserve it? No. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. When I received Christ, when you received Christ, it was all but a gift, something freely given. I couldn't earn it. I couldn't deserve it. And the same is still true today. I still can't earn it, and I still can't deserve it. It's given to me freely by grace. The same is still going to be true the day I see Jesus face to face. It's all by grace through faith. You see, when I get to heaven one day, I'm going to be able to say, I, I'm saved by the blood of Christ, not the blood of Christ and anything else. If I think that I'm saved by the blood of Christ and my good works, wrong. I'm saved by the blood of Christ and the amount of money I gave, wrong. I'm saved by the blood of Christ and the amount of time I spent praying, wrong. Now, those things aren't bad things, and God wants us to do those things, but not because we're trying to prove ourselves to him. We don't have to prove ourselves to him. He's already proven himself to us. You see, it was through understanding God's grace that now today I can stand before you and say that I'm walking in victory with Jesus. When I look back at that time in my life, I realize that God allowed me to fail and to fail miserably because he knew that my false idea of Jesus had to die so that I could receive the truth of who he is, of what he's done, and who he's made me to be. See, out of my unexpected ending of utter failure, God brought about a new beginning of freedom in Christ. You see, God is more interested in revealing to you and me the truth of who he is, what he's done, and who he's made you and me to be. He's more interested in revealing that than he is in just answering every request we make and allowing us to continue in wrong believing. I prayed daily for Jesus to take away my struggle. But instead of taking it away from me, he allowed me to, con to fail so that way I would not continue in wrong believing. And it was through believing rightly that I was able to finally find freedom in Christ. And I can walk in victory today because of that. The same is true for each one of you. So I ask again, does your idea of Jesus line up with the truth of who he is in the Bible? If not, let it die so you can receive the truth of who he really is. And I guarantee he will transform you. His truth is greater than anything we can try to muster up in our minds. Worship team, if you would uh, come. As we prepare to close this morning, I'm just going to take a moment to consider another character that we talked about in our biblical narrative this morning. Now, this person experienced an unexpected turn of events, that's for sure. But for him, it was totally in his favor. Any guesses of who it might be? Barabbas. Barabbas. The Bible says that Barabbas was a notorious criminal, a troublemaker, a thief, a murderer. Some translations call him a rabble rouser, whatever that may be. See, Barabbas was in jail and ultimately bound for the cross because he was guilty. He was guilty of his crimes, and he was going to pay with them, pay for them with his life. But in an unexpected change of events, Jesus, who had done absolutely nothing wrong, ended up taking Barabbas' place on the cross. And instead, Barabbas was the one who was set free. Out of an unexpected ending, God brought a new beginning. Out of an unexpected ending, God brought a new beginning. Barabbas, criminal, murderer. 
Did you realize that he's actually the very first person to benefit from Jesus going to the cross? I hadn't ever thought of that until I talked to our business administrator here, Becky. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what Barabbas did with this new beginning, but we do know that he had a choice. He could have either returned to his old way of life and that landed him in jail, that bound him for the cross, or he could have taken the gift of Jesus' sacrifice and lived a new life changed by the grace of Jesus Christ. Today, we all need to take a minute and realize that we are Barabbas. Each one of us here is Barabbas. Each one of us, like Barabbas, have found ourselves bound in a prison of our sin. The Bible says that each of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means that each of us are guilty, and we each deserve to pay the penalty of our sin with our lives. We were all bound for the excruciating pain of eternal separation from God. But Jesus stepped in. He took our place on the cross. And he paid the penalty for our wrongdoing. You see, he bore the weight of our sin on himself. And he died a substitutionary death in our place for us. So that we could have this new beginning. Each one of us, like Barabbas, have to come to a moment of decision. What are we going to do with what Jesus did for us? What are we going to do with what Jesus did for us? Will we spit on his sacrifice and continue in our old way, going back to the same things that led us in that same road of, that same jail of sin? ultimately destined for an eternity apart from God? Or will we take this opportunity to seize hold of Jesus' free gift of salvation, allow him to transform us into the person that he created us to be, one bound for an eternity with him in heaven? What are we going to do with what Jesus did for us? Now, some of us have already come to that point of decision and we've chosen to forsake our old selves and with great joy have received that free gift of salvation. Maybe someone here is saying, well, what is salvation? Well, it all starts the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. In that moment, the Bible says there's this divine exchange that takes place. It makes me weep because it's, I'm so unworthy of it. But the Bible says that all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our guilt, the moment we put our faith in Christ, it's all cast off. It's already been paid for by the blood of Jesus through his death on the cross. And in exchange for all of our stuff that nobody should ever want, in exchange for all of that, Jesus gives us his robes of righteousness, that means that we have the right, right standing before God the Father. We can now go boldly before the throne of grace to receive mercy and grace in our time of need because of what Jesus did for us at the cross if we put our faith in him. The Bible says that the moment we put our faith in Jesus, we are adopted into God's family and we are made co-heirs with Jesus. Guys, that means that when God looks at you, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he sees you like he sees his son. Can you imagine how much love that is? He loves us that much. Today, there are many in this room who have already made the decision to put their faith in Jesus. But maybe still, there are some that are at that point of decision. Which way are you going to choose? Back to that prison of bondage or into the freedom that Jesus died to give you? The truth is, is that however we answer that question really does determine where we will spend the rest of our eternity. If I could ask you to bow your heads. With every eye closed, if you would say that, Pastor Chris, I'm at that point of decision. I choose to follow Jesus. Would you raise your hand? 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I'm not going to ask anyone to do anything that would embarrass you. Thank you. I see those hands. Is there anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. I see those hands out there, guys. Guys, there's, there's a, a savior who desires relationship with you, who loves you more than any love you could ever know. I'm just going to give one more moment. Is there anyone else who would say, today I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ? Thank you. Thank you. I see your hand. Guys, I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I'm going to ask for those of you who raised your hand just now, if you would pray this prayer, and for those who have already given their heart to Christ, would you also pray this prayer with me just so that everybody can, can pray together? There's nothing necessarily magical about the words I'm going to say, but it's about what happens in our heart. So if you would repeat after me, Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I am a sinner. And in need of a savior. And in need of a savior. Right now I ask, Right now I ask that you would come into my life. That you would come into my life. Cleanse me of my sin. Cleanse me. And be my Lord and Savior. And be my Lord and Savior. Today I surrender my life. Today I surrender my life. Completely to you. Completely to you. And I want to serve you. And I want to serve you. From this day forward. From this day forward. Amen. 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 Guys, if that was you, I want you to know that there is a celebration taking place in heaven right now. That's right. They're so excited about every soul that has come to Jesus. And one day we will all celebrate together in heaven. If you put your faith in Christ, the Bible gives us, gives us this assurance that we will be with God. So I'm so excited for each one of you. There is no greater decision you could ever make in your life. Now just before we close, I know uh, we're, we're coming close. Just bear with me one more minute if you would. Just in case there's someone who's here that maybe you've already put your faith in Christ and you're realizing, though, that your idea of who Jesus is may not be entirely accurate. Maybe like me, without even realizing it, you adopted a works-based salvation. You feel like you have to some way prove yourself to Jesus for him to be happy with you or for him to love you. If that's you today, can I encourage you that you don't have to try and prove your love to Christ. You don't have to try to prove your love to God because he already proved his love to us in everything he did. The Bible says that it was while we were still sinners that Jesus died for us. You see, he accepts us as we are and loves us so much that through his grace, he transforms us into the person that he created us to be. So if there is an idea of Jesus or his gospel in your mind that does not line up with the truth that we have in God's word, then let it go. Let it die so you can receive the truth of who he is. I guarantee his truth is greater than any truth we could try to muster up in our minds. The team is going to lead us in one more song of worship. And if the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart about something today, let him take care of business. He knows what we need even better than we do. Grayson.